There is no soft landing. This time is never different. And markets told us this was going to happen. Now that it is happening, we can turn to those same markets to start getting answers for how bad this might get. And there's three sets of indications and three sets of markets that we're going to lean on to start piecing together those answers. They'll give us some preliminary guidelines, a rough initial sketch, but keep in mind, this is a dynamic situation. There's a lot of variables and a lot of moving parts. Now, of course, all of these massive market moves were triggered by the labor market data that came out on Friday, confirming what we've already known. As I showed my video on Thursday, we were very likely past the point of no return even before Friday's jump in the unemployment rate. That's along with the low payroll number, they merely confirmed the transition from half recession to full blown. So turning to our three markets, we've got treasuries confirming the when and the what, we've got forward rates that are starting to look into how low rates might get so we can get a sense of how bad, and swaps give us the longer run picture for what everything could look like once this is over. Summertime is the time for recession. So please, for the love of God, ignore Jay Powell and the Fed. You can also mute the financial media because they're gonna tell us that everything's just fine, no big deal, just a little softness, right up until the Fed starts its first panicky rate cut. And then they're gonna memory hole this whole soft landing narrative that they crafted and then tell us how wonderful the rate cuts will be and how powerful stimulus they'll end up having. We know that's not true. None of it is true. So let's start piecing together some real answers. So I said it started Friday. It actually started before Friday. There was jolts, there was jobless claims, a whole bunch of labor market indications, ISM corporate reports, a whole lot indicating that we were heading for trouble even before we got to Friday's payroll numbers. And I'll break down the unemployment rate and the full payroll report in tomorrow's video. Today, I wanna to focus on what the markets are saying about now that we know it's happening, how bad could this possibly get? And before we get to the three markets I wanna focus on, other markets are reacting in the same way. Stocks, for example, even the stock market, down big the last couple days. And unlike the correction back in April, this time it's happening with interest rates plunging. Rate cuts are not your friend. Lower interest rates signal nothing good. So stocks are definitely correcting in a way that's kind of reminiscent of late 2007 when the S&P 500 hit its all time high up to that point in October 2007 after the Federal Reserve started cutting rates before realizing that that great not recession was not going to be great for shares, the economy, or pretty much anyone. In addition to the stock market correcting, oil prices, oil is down below $74 per barrel. Despite the fact that there's all sorts of geopolitical and Middle East flare-ups, oil under $74 is back to almost its early June low and threatening to go below it. Gasoline prices, wholesale gasoline at the CME at $231 per gallon, that's the lowest wholesale price since February. So energy prices are going lower because this isn't just about Chinese demand, the U.S. was in trouble too. Starting with that first market indication, we've got U.S. Treasuries and the yield curve, making a very aggressive bull steepening case just over the last couple of days. It's really been ongoing for several weeks now, but the last couple of days have just been mind blowing. And the bull steepening case is not a good one. That's one where we see nominal rates are falling all across the curve, but they're falling much faster at the front than in the middle or the back. So the curve that's inverted starts to uninvert as, as nominal rates are going down, the entire curve is going down, it's just going down faster at the front so that it uninverts, uninverts and steepen, steepens back out, but at a much lower nominal level. That's historically consistent with recession cases. Classic bull steepening is exactly what we're seeing here. The two year US Treasury as of Friday, all the way down to 3.89%. And it's down 47 basis points in yield just since July 29th. The 10 year US Treasury, by comparison, that's at 3.82%, but down 35 basis points. So the two year is down 12 more basis points in yield than the tens. So the two year, 10 year spread has nearly uninverted now. It's still inverted by only seven basis points, which is the least amount that that spread has been inverted. So there's a decisive move in the two year, 10 year spread. 
The five-year U.S. Treasury at the middle of the curve, 3.64%, which is a more than year low, surpassing last year's bond rally. At 364, it's down 40 basis points since July 29th. And the five-year, 10-year spread is now plus 17, which means it's uninverted to 17 basis points, which is a strong, aggressive, decisive, bull steepening move in the key critical middle part of the treasury curve. Even the 30-year long bond, that's down 29 basis points over the last couple of days, last three, four days at 4.12%. But that means that the two-year, 30-year spread, which uninverted a little while ago, is now hugely uninverted to positive 24 basis points. So what you're seeing is a strong, decisive, bull steepening move in the U.S. Treasury yield curve. An aggressive bull steepening move is also a timing move. So it tells us that the half recession that we've been experiencing since last October at least has indeed passed that point of no return I talked about in Thursday's video. We've, we've, we've hit the point of nonlinearity where the economy is going to start really de degrading and deteriorating. That's what the bull steepening tells us, that we're finally into the full recession case. And it's not just the United States. This is going on all over the world. Europe, the German curve, there's aggressive move lower in interest rates in Germany along with bull steepening on the German curve. Even Japanese, the government bond market there. Despite the fact that the Bank of Japan raised rates just last week, just a few days ago, Friday, Japanese government bond yields are down substantially. This is becoming a globally synchronized issue because it's a globally synchronized recession. It's a, it's a globally synchronized cycle, the downside of the supply shock. And now we're seeing confirmation of it, finally, in the U.S. labor market, sort of the last global holdout. So with the treasury market giving us a sense of what and when, we'll look at forward interest rates to get an idea, at least a preliminary idea of how bad it might get and how low interest rates might go over the near term. That means SOFR futures. And I really wish we had Euro dollar futures, but we're stuck with SOFR futures. So that's what we're going to use. And SOFR futures like US treasuries have made an absolutely insanely aggressive move over the last couple of days, particularly Thursday and Friday. In fact, an even more insane move than we see on the U.S. Treasury curve. Some of these contracts have been bid 20, 30 basis points each day, especially focused on December 2024, March of 2025, and June of 2025. What that tells us is that just like the bull case in the Treasury market, SOFR futures are looking at the, at the recession as a near-term phenomenon. We see that right from the front of the SOFR futures curve, the September 2024 contract. Now, keep in mind, SOFR futures work differently than euro dollar futures. It's sort of an average of the quarter, basically, in this case, with the September 2024 contract, the fourth quarter, an average of what SOFR is going to be during that period. But the September 2024 contract, that's, that's up 30 basis points in price just over the last couple of days, Thursday and Friday, which has brought its implied yield to 4.735%. Now, again, we don't take SOFR futures literally. The market is not saying that SOFR is going to be 4.735 on average during the fourth quarter. It gives us a range of probabilities and therefore a range of possibilities. And an implied rate of 4.735% for September 2024 that's starting to price scenarios where we might have a possibility of a 50 basis point rate cut, potentially an intermediate cut before we even get to September, which is not all that outlandish because Jay Powell at his press conference, reading between the lines, it sounded like he really wanted to start cutting rates at the last week's meeting here in July. So the, the front end of the SOFR futures contract is moving in a way that suggests the Fed might start aggressively once it does start. And that's not necessarily... Out that's not unusual either. Back in 2007, the Fed began with a 50 basis point rate cut in September 2007. It did the same thing in 2001 before the dot-com recession. Started in January 2001 with a 50 and then came out with several more 50s after that. So it's not necessarily out, outside the realm of possibilities that once the Fed does start moving, that it starts moving aggressively, particularly given the fact that the unemployment rate suggests the labor market has moved into its nonlinear position, which means... The economy is going to be deteriorating pretty rapidly over the next couple months, and the Fed is going to be chasing the unemployment rate. And that's really what the SOFR, SOFR futures curve is all about. 
What it's really saying when you step back and look at it is that once the Fed does start cutting, not only is it likely to be aggressive from the very beginning, large rate cuts, it's not going to stop anytime soon. When you look at the rest of the curve, for example, the December 2024, that's up almost 50 basis points in price just the last two days, Thursday, Thursday and Friday. March 2025, which saw the most interest, again, consistent with a near-term recession. June up 56 basis points over the last couple of days at 334. And really the curve starts to bottom out around December of 2025 at an applied yield of 3%. So what that tells us is a couple things. Again, don't take these contracts literally. The market is not saying SOFR is going to be 3% at the end of next year. What it is saying is that the chances that the Fed does a series of aggressive rate cuts is exceptionally high. That once they start cutting, they start out cutting quickly and do it fast and they do it furiously. That it's not just going to be one rate cut or two, some gentle, gentle insurance in case the economy becomes a little bit softer than the soft landing narrative would have it. And the further down the implied yields go and the further down the curve compresses, the higher the chance that, the, that there is going to be a series of rate cuts. And most of all, the greater the chance that series of rate cuts ends up around zero. And so what does that tell us about possibilities for the recession that we're facing. Well, as we know that the Fed's rate cuts don't stop the recession, they certainly don't help with unemployment. So as long as the unemployment rate continues to rise, the Fed is going to continue to chase it by moving its, its policy rates even lower. And that's what the futures curve is telling us, that because we're expecting a series of rate cuts out of the Fed, the macroeconomy side of that is a rising and maybe even rapidly rising unemployment rate. The last of our three market indications, interest rate swaps and interest rate swap spreads. Interest rate swaps all of long have been saying sort of what we're seeing from the SOFR futures curve, that once interest rates go down, they're going to go down quite a ways. But more than that, swaps are telling us once they go down, they're likely to stay there. So we have consistency in the treasury market, in the forward rate market with SOFR futures. And now with interest rate swaps, not only do they agree with the direction of both of those, they're going beyond it to tell us a little bit about the aftermath. Because remember how interest rate swaps work. And I talked about this in a recent video. On the one side, you've got dealers and their balance sheet capacities and being constrained. That's the supply side. But you also have the demand side, demand for hedging. And in the longer term and longer dated interest rate swaps, to make sense of that hedge or to make that hedge worthwhile, to make money on the hedge, Interest rates not only have to go down, they have to go down and they have to stay down for a long period of time to make that swap pay out. So the further down the fixed leg of the interest rate swap goes, especially in relation to the U.S. Treasury, therefore the swap spread, the more that we know that dealers are constrained, deflationary money potential, but on the hedging side, there's more, of a, there's more, in, more people in the marketplace who are betting that once rates go down, they're going to stay there for a long period of time. We've seen that in the 10-year swap spread as well as the 30-year swap spread that have made very aggressive moves just over the last several weeks to, to last month or so, consistent with everything else that we're seeing here. And remember, too, interest rate swap spread, they correlate very strongly with U.S. Treasury yields anyway over the, over the longer run period of time especially going back to 2007 and 2008. Every time the treasury yields have deviated to the high side for whatever reason, eventually they go back down to where the interest rate swap market and the swap spread has priced, especially the 30 year. Back in 2018, for example, treasury yields got pushed higher by the Fed's rate hikes and eventually they fell back down to where the interest rate swap spread was. And I think we're starting to see exactly that happen, especially with the aggressive move in treasury, aggressive move lower in treasury yields over the last little while here. Swap spreads, especially the 30 year spread, had indicated that the uh, 10 year treasury, for example, was likely to end up going down to converge where swaps are somewhere around 2%, maybe 1%. So when you put all of these together, you do get a consistent signal, not just of interest rates going lower, but potentially remaining there. So the treasury market, the bull steepening tells us this thing is happening. The SOFR curve says aggressive series of rate cuts from the Fed, maybe very aggressive from the very start, which is not a positive indication. And then the swap market finishes up by saying, 
Once rates go down, as these other markets are telling us, rates are going to go down. Once rates go down, they're very likely to stay there for a prolonged period of time. So what happens when we do put all these three together? So again, the treasury curve telling us it's happening. The SOFR futures curve compressing, seeing, saying aggressive series of rate cuts, rates were likely to go down and go down quite a ways. And then interest rate swap spreads, longer dated ones telling us that rates, once they go down, are likely to stay down. What are the scenarios that these three markets are, when we put those together, what did they give us? And of course, there are not any good scenarios here. They start out with the recession, but when you add in the interest rate swap and the long run, long run aspect of it, we could end up with a mild recession where the unemployment rate rises pretty substantially, but not catastrophically. But then it's followed by another jobless recovery, which by the way, to me, this would be the worst case scenario. If we have a mild recession and then basically no recovery afterward, it would just be another ratchet down in the general economy, which we really can't afford. That would be consistent with exactly what we're seeing in all these marketplaces. It could also mean a much bigger recession with maybe a little bit better, better recovery on the other side that would be more like reflation, not, not necessarily a full recovery. We could have a very sharp and very short recession in the near term and then get partway back on the other side into 2025. Or we could have a very sharp recession that goes on for quite a little ways before interest rates start to go back up as the recovery happens. There's a number of different possibilities, just they don't include many or any that are positive to the upside. So in a mild recession, jobless recovery, to me, that's the worst case. That's consistent with the markets, though we could be seeing something worse in the near term. Those questions and those dimensions are left to be put together over the weeks and months ahead. So we'll stay on top of what these three markets are telling us and we'll stay, stay on top of the macroeconomic developments as they come about because all of these things go together. This was always a cycle. And now that more people are starting to see it, it was a cycle, forget the soft landing, no landing stuff from earlier this year, forget about inflation. Now we can start focusing on the real questions, the short run, as well as what this means for the long run. I've said all along that the markets were telling us the 2020s were going to look like the 2010s. And it was the swap market that told us most of all and what to expect for treasury yields as they start to move in that direction. That's the video link below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers. Until next time, take care.